Welcome into episode 201 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Peru and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget, Scott, how are we doing this week? Anything going on? Any hockey news to talk about? Uh, just Stanley Cup final and Bruce Cassidy, two wins away from winning a Stanley Cup from doing what, you know, Bruins came up short of doing in 2019. And I feel like, you know, I feel like that's all the talk around here is Bruce Cassidy is going to beat the Bruins to a cup first, first year away. He's, uh, looks like he's going to get it done. Um, you know, I, I think we've learned you can't count out, count out the Panthers came back from three, one down against the Bruins, but man, Vegas has really just dominated that this series so far. And looks like Sergei Bobrovsky's magic has kind of worn off and, I don't know. I don't know if that Panthers team has it to come to come back against Vegas. Uh, that's a that's a really tall hill to try to climb. Yeah, in I last episode we said, or was it last episode where we were giving our predictions, and um, Scott and I both said Vegas in seven. Brian, did you say in six? I mean, it looks like it could be even shorter at this point, but. Um, Never count the Panthers out, though. So that's that's one thing for sure. But it does seem like they're outmatched and their depth has been exposed by uh, Vegas's depth for sure. And Hill's been playing really well in net for them. So uh, the, the storyline that we have been following from both sides has been the, you know, the Kachucks of the world, like, like we talked about last week. Um, would the Bruins have... Would it have been a good move for the Bruins to try to get Kachuk, even if it meant trading Pasternak because of all the things Kachuk has brought to the Panthers in the playoffs? It, and this round, it hasn't made a difference for the Panthers yet. Um, he has, um, you know, found himself a subject of conversation again with the hit on Eichel. Um, his physicality, he continues to bring it. But then when you look at the rest of the Panthers team, they're they're – Depth just isn't there, especially offensively. And then Gudis took that big hit, or I mean, technically, it's kind of him trying to hit uh, Barbashev, but he ends up getting hurt. That's a a key injury if you know if he's not able to play, or if he's not one hundred percent. So that's what you're dealing with with Florida. And then in Boston, the storyline is the Bruce Cassidy thing for sure because. Um, we can play hypothetical and we did a few times when the season ended before we knew that Cassidy's team was about to make the finals. So now that they're there and only two wins away from winning a Stanley cup, potentially uh, it definitely just adds more fuel to the narrative that, you know, did the Bruins make a mistake moving on for him and what would their season have looked like? How far would they have gotten if they'd kept him? And that's something that we want to start out the podcast with. So Brian, this is something that I know you want to vent about a little bit. So we'll go to you. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's a lot to pick at here. A lot on this bone to pick at. It's not so much a venting session. Like I texted you guys before the podcast recording and I totally admit that Bruce Cassidy's message was stale in Boston and that the players weren't responding to him and that a change rightfully or wrongfully so needed to take place. Fine. What, what annoys me and the question that I still have is why was his message growing stale? Like all like Bruce Cassidy, I can I understand he might be a little bit in your face, but one thing he doesn't lack is transparency. So from 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 my perspective, because players just didn't like hearing from him what they were doing wrong so often, what they needed to do better. I guess simply put, it just it it it, it makes me feel like like a lot like a lot of players in that room were just a little bit mentally soft, and 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 it was kind of a mutiny. And and you know to hear to know the story about Jake DeBrusque and Cassidy and how they didn't get along, that's one thing, right? You could see that on TV watching the games like they just didn't really get along too well but when you have leaders like Bergeron and Marchand and 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 guys that have been around the block playing playing on that in that Felino like I just I just don't understand why the why the veterans instead of being taking the coach's side and being like guys if you want to succeed in this league you have to be able to handle tough love instead of going going with that approach and knowing that Bruce Cassidy is doing it out of because he cares and he wants the best out of them 
it just seems like everybody just took the side, like the player sides, and include like the, like they just felt bad for themselves. And so, I I'm not debating that the message didn't grow stale and that a change wasn't needed. I'm just asking why because clearly this Bruins team didn't excel with a new coach in the playoffs this year. So I just you and like you watch Bruce Cassidy, and not only is he going to potentially win the Stanley Cup, but he's going to do so by eliminating the team potentially in four games that beat Boston this year in the first round. So I just think that it's fair to question if the players just lacked a little bit of mental fortitude under, under a hard nosed coach. That's all I'm saying. And if that's the case, that just pisses me off because you have to be able to take that if you want to win. And you, you can't just have your ass wiped because you're a professional athlete. Like you have to, you have to be able to grin and bear some, some tough love. And I just feel like maybe, maybe they got to enjoy going to work better every day without Bruce Cassidy, big, bad Bruce Cassidy around. But you know what? Maybe if they stuck with him a little bit longer and, and maybe just or just bought into him a little bit more and didn't allow his message to grow so stale because maybe, maybe they'd be hoisting a Stanley Cup or I don't, I don't know. It's, 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 it's tough to go back in time and stuff in the revisionist history. I just don't like it because the, the 2011 Bruins team we watched win the Stanley Cup would have never – they would have never been like pouty and oh, we need a coaching change. And it just speaks to a lack of maybe just, I don't know, maturity maybe, but it, it, that surprises me because there's a lot of mature guys that have been around. So I'm just confused by the whole situation and to see it playing out the way that it is for Bruce Cassidy, it just makes you wonder. And I think it's fair based on how Boston played this spring. Yeah, I, I think it's fair, but I also think like there was a long time when the players did buy in and did listen and the leaders did work with Cassidy to try to get through to younger guys. And my feeling on this has always kind of been like, I just think, especially in hockey, like almost any coach's message eventually gets stale. Like if you look at, I looked this up yesterday. Do you know how many coaches in the NHL right now have been in their current jobs for longer than five years? Mm, Mike Sullivan. Three. Three, okay. three. three out of 32 coaches have been in their current job for longer than five years. Mike Sullivan won John Cooper and Jared Bednar out in Colorado. So there's a lot of turnover and like, obviously a lot of those teams, you know, aren't successful, aren't making the playoffs every year, but even ones who are pretty frequently in the playoffs tend just tend to make changes. Um, you know, I think Cassidy does have a style that can, over time, great on players. And yeah, it's absolutely fair to look at the players and say, well, be tougher, you know, so what tough shit. Um, but you know, it's not, it's not like it was just that he was critical of them. We also heard things about the ways that he was sometimes critical where it'd be, you know, like almost like comments under his breath on the bench that players would hear or, you know, they'd make a mistake and he'd like immediately just bench them, say like, you're not taking next shift or something like that. And and it led to feelings of, you know, I can't screw up because I'm not going to play the rest of the game or the rest of the period if I do. And again, if you want to take the stance that, Hey, tough shit, that's the NHL, get over it. Like, I, I think that's fair. I also just think that the days of, of players having to put up with tough love, are vanishing across all sports. Like I think more and more we're seeing that players, coaches by and large tend to have more success and tend to do better with today's players. Um, so, you know, like I, I do understand why some Bruins players felt like, you know, like they're kind of getting sick of hearing from Cassie and kind of getting sick of, some of the ways that, you know, he would react on the bench when there was a mistake. Um, you know, I don't think it was like a mass, like this long line of players, like outside Don Sweeney's office demanding for him to be fired. But I think there was the openness of them telling Sweeney, you know, look, he's not, he's not really getting through to some guys anymore. And his message is wearing on some guys. And, I think Don Sweeney heard that and, and felt like if, you know, if we're making one or two more runs at this, it might be time for a different voice. And it's the same decision they made before when they fired Claude Julian, you know, another really good coach um, who's 
style and message had just kind of gotten stale. Like players felt like they were being restricted under Claude Julian and, you know, couldn't, couldn't play like the way that they wanted to. Um, and so that became time for a change there. It's, you know, Bruce Cassidy replaced a really good coach here. He replaced a really good coach in Vegas and Pete DeBoer. Um, so I think, you know, criticism of Bruins players, totally fair. But I also like still can't sit here and be like, oh, they made a mistake letting him go because I kind of just think, you know, when you get to five, six years with one coach, like more often than not, it it does get stale and, and it kind of becomes time for a change. Yeah, but like – I, I understand that. And, and people will say, you know, would all the players have come back if, if Cassidy was the coach? What, you know, what would the dynamic have been like with that? But just remember the last, when they were in the playoffs, the last series against Carolina with Cassidy as the coach, he was pushing the right buttons. And it was the guys on the team that just were not playing to the are we, standard are we that sure? they needed to. You, you, I mean, you I remember, I, I remember second guessing Cassidy. Like I, I, I thought he waited. I thought he waited too long in that series to put Pasternak on the top line. Like I thought he had him buried with, with Eric Halla on that second line where they were just getting demolished in their own zone and not even getting offensive chances. Like I thought he stuck with that too long in that series. We were all saying that it would be a scapegoat move at the time. We were all saying that it would be a scapegoat move to blame Cassidy for the exit in that round. And to be the guy that takes the blame for some of the other um, issues, which, you know, we were blaming on Don Sweeney, the adding the wrong pieces, like adding Eric Halla, um, you know, not necessarily, that was a year that Felino didn't play great. Um, you know, it, there were, there were some moves made in the off season that we were blaming Sweeney for and saying that you kind of gave Cassidy not a lot to work with, but he did what he could with what he had. And, you know, he would have had even more to work with this season. Um, he would have had Lind home for a full season. Uh, you know, you, you look at at the way that he maybe would have handled the goalie situation differently, which obviously we can criticize the goalies from last playoffs, but he was willing to make the switch. Um, I don't know. It's all revisionist, of course. But I think, Brian, what you were talking about with um, – you know, why did the players let it get stale? That's that that's the big question. Like, were they were they giving up on him for just personality reasons? Did did was the message not really working? It it clearly is working in Vegas, so uh it's it's hard to say, but I don't know. I never was really I didn't really think Cassidy needed to go yet. I, Cassidy himself said he was pretty shocked when he had that meeting with Sweeney and Sweeney let him go. And he wasn't, it wasn't like he was on his way out. Like it wasn't an obvious thing that, Oh yeah. You know, cut ties with the coach. It seemed like that was, you know, it wasn't even a hundred. I'm not even sure Don Sweeney was a hundred percent sure that he wanted to do it. So um, it's definitely worth talking about. And, and Sweeney did lead the team to a final in 2019 um, obviously we know what happened with that, but, um, he had, and we talked about this when you have a group that the Bruins had that, you know, it's their last window and they had one of the best teams that we've ever seen. Uh, you want a guy more than, more than likely you want a guy, a coach that has playoff experience, more playoff experience. Cassidy has more playoff experience than Montgomery does. And it, it's, uh, it's hard to say, you know, the Bruins would have made it farther or not, but it's, it is easy to see that Cassidy was still a great coach and, and still does a good job in the playoffs, even though he's doing it with Vegas. And it just adds a little bit of salt in the wound. Yeah. I mean, it's, there, there's just, at the end of the day, I just felt that none of us were sitting here this time last year saying that the reason the Bruins lost to the Hurricanes was because of coaching. Uh, the reason the Bruins lost last year is because personnel wise, they, they lost their number two center in the summertime and just didn't adequately replace that, that play. I mean, like Eric Hollow was fine, but the, the Bruins, the Bruins were, they were, they were a top two center short last year. And that's just kind of trickled throughout the, the rest of the lineup. And 
and it affected where you put passion act, right? Scott, I mean, that was a balancing act. That's what that was. So, I mean, we weren't really, I don't really recall us too, too often last year saying put passion act with Bergeron and Martian. Cause if you remember Hall, Halla and passion act were pretty good the second half of the year and it did help balance out the lines and Jake DeBrus did have a better bounce back second half of the season. So yeah, there were times in the hurricane series where maybe it was appropriate. And, and, and I do remember them doing that, but I just the, the biggest thing for me is he wasn't the reason that they lost last year. And, and the only time I can I consider like if you think about Bruce Cassidy's tenure in Boston, the his first season, he took over halfway through. They lost to the Senators in round one. They were a goal away from the from the Seneca finals, the Senators team. Um, the following year, you beat Toronto. You lost to a juggernaut in Tampa. The following year, you go to the cup finals. You lose in game seven. That one, all, we all believe that Bruins left one up there. And then in the following year is the bubble. Like you can chalk that up to that. I do think that Bruce Cassidy was potentially out coached in the Islanders series. I didn't see a reason the Bruins should have lost that series. But then the Hurricane series, it just the personnel wasn't there. So for me, I just and like I said, I know that once once the players feel that the the, the message is stale and a change needs to happen, I understand it's happening. And to your point, Scott, shelf life, I get it. What annoys me is just I, I just it's fair to question now. Why, why was the message stale? Is it because he really was that bad of a guy or is it because the players just like, they just, they just, I don't know. Like, but whatever the reason, I just feel like Bruce Cassidy, if he had this Bruins roster, and that's a big F because you guys will say, and not, not you two in particular, but people will say like Bridget mentioned, certain guys may not have come back had a Cassidy event here. And to that, I say that's bullshit. Cause it's like, yeah. well, do you like, that's, 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 that's insane. Like the, the guy, like a, 667 winning percentage as a coach he wasn't he wasn't the devil um but if he had this roster like you're not losing to florida and 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 i just feel like if the bruins the the only way that this could have been and i and believe me like losing in the first round is torture for this bruins franchise but as it turns out if the bruins did go to the cup finals and you never know about the butterfly effect, but I don't think there's an interconference butterfly effect happening here. I think if the Bruins went to the finals, Vegas still would have done their thing and got to the finals. So if Bruce Cassidy beat the Bruins in the cup finals this year, that would be just a movie script ending for him. And, and that would be a really tough pill for the Bruins to swallow. And I got to be honest, last year when he went to Vegas in the offseason, I kind of thought that. I was like, what if what if the Bruins, like, of course, the Bruins will probably play Vegas if they go to the finals this year. And that that is how it would have played out. And if it did play out that way, I think Cassidy probably would have beaten the Bruins just because he knows so much about them. And, and I don't know. So anyway, it's just, it's a fun conversation. It's um, I'm really happy for Cassidy. Like I, I clearly want him to win. I have like, like he deserves, he deserved it so much. Like he was a great coach here. I very happy for him. So hopefully he can finish the job. It's just definitely, it's of course, this is, this is how, it, this is how it goes for the Bruins. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd also like to see him win. Like famously, he was always very good with us in the media. Um, you know, if you listen to some of the whispers, maybe sometimes too good and too honest with us. And that's another thing that, you know, I think players didn't like sometimes is, you know, cause he always, he would always say, well, I don't tell you guys anything I haven't told them. And I think that was accurate. However, I think there's also things that players probably wanted to keep behind closed doors that, he was willing to tell the media. Um, but Scott, do you ever recall being in a media session and thinking he like crossed the line with any of that stuff though? Like, was not, there anything that stuck out to you where you're like, Oh, he shouldn't have said that about DeBras. See, like, Not to me because like me neither. I'm in the media. So I, I want to hear that stuff. And like, no, but you like know, I you we still stuff. have a gauge of what might negatively affect the locker room. If yeah, you say it, I mean that there were, there were times though where like, I would think where he would say something critical about a player and it would like at least cross my mind that like, uh, like he's probably not going to be thrilled that, that he said that type thing. Um, never did I think it was like, Oh my God. Like he's just like attacking this guy and tearing mm -hmm. him down. Like I never thought that, but there were definitely times where I thought like players probably not going to be too thrilled that he's telling us that. Um, and by but, the way, like his his issues with Jake DeBrusque are the ones that are like most prominent. But if you recall, when DeBrusque started playing better, he started rewarding DeBrusque with better yeah. shifts on better lines. It wasn't and unfair. spoke very positively about yeah. him, like towards the end of last year. Yeah, yeah. It was just, so just to like address one other thing though. So 
on last year's loss, I wasn't trying to make it sound like they lost because of Cassie or anything. Like we, you're right. Like we covered that. Obviously he wasn't the reason they lost. I'm just saying like, I think there's been a little bit of revisionist history trying to make it sound like Cassidy didn't make mistakes or like wouldn't have made mistakes that Montgomery made this year. And I, I just think he did. I think every coach does. And so like, that's why I was highlighting that of like, I think there was last year in that series, like Cassidy at times was too slow to make adjustments. Just like, you know, I think this, this time you can rip Montgomery for being too adjustment happy and throwing his lines in a blender. You know, you, you mentioned like Cassidy was quicker to make a goalie change last year. Fair. The year before he was too slow. He stuck with two Garask too long while he was dealing with a torn hip labrum. So, you know, yes, Bruce Cassidy was and is a great coach. I'm certainly not arguing against that. I just want to highlight, like, he's also not perfect. Like, he did make mistakes. And Yeah. yeah. My, my last point about him and just to make the comparison with Montgomery, um, which is why that this story gets a little bit more fuel, is because one of the criticisms about Montgomery after this playoffs was that he maybe let the players – make too many of the decisions on their own. And Cassidy would not have done that. Cassidy was mm. more in control, I feel, of the situation. I, his teams. I mean, you I remember lots of times where let... Cassidy, I remember lots of times where Cassidy said he deferred to Bergeron too. So I'm talking about, I'm more, more so talking about Ber- um, Allmark. Well, I, well, like I, I just said it to, to 2021 against the Islanders. When they stuck with Tuga Rask, Cassie's explanation was I talked to him and he said he's he's good to go. Yeah, but so, I, also I mean, feel like it's literally the same exact mistake. His relationship was to, with Tuca was different, though, because Tuca had been with the program for a long time. And like Allmark is kind of a newer person that came in while Cassidy was there. And I, I just think that the dynamic would be different, especially after, you know, learning his lesson with Tuca, especially. I'm not sure if he would have messed around with the injuries. Um, and kind of let the players say whether or not they were ready as much as Montgomery did. Um, there's just very different coaches, very different styles of coaching. I wonder how he would have handled the defensive rotation with Grizzlick, with Clifton. Um, I wonder how he would have handled that differently. I highly doubt he would have thrown everything in the blender, like you mentioned, because chemistry, um, you know, not wanting to mess with the chemistry of, some of those lines, I, uh, it's it's hard to say. You know, do they have as great a season? Probably not. Like the record probably doesn't get broken. But then, if if we're talking about a team that makes the playoffs, still, like, I kind of would have rather had Cassidy pushing the buttons back there. Maybe that's just because we saw how disastrous some of the decisions were by Montgomery. Was it Game Five? That was the time they started with the crazy lines and switch back to it i uh, switched back to some of their normal stuff pretty quickly but like i don't i don't think cassidy is he's got too much experience to just try something crazy and new that they don't know if it works in the playoffs like that so i i know this conversation started with bruce cassidy and just because of the the relevancy of him being in the finals and the bruins getting rid of him but i think for me and if i'm really if, if this was like a like a psych psychiatry lesson and I was talking to a therapist or something like that. (laughs) I think for me, it's really difficult for me to admit because I love these players. I think deep down, like I'm actually just like pretty annoyed at like Bergeron and Marsh. And I think because they're, they're hall of fame players, certainly for the Bruins and, and Bergeron NHL hall of famer, Brad Marsh. And I mean, you make an argument already. I think he'll be in. Mm-hmm, me too. Like they're they are truly two of my like the my favorite players I've, I've ever watched. And so for me, it's like certain things pop into my brain because the coach. Because to your your point, Scott, coaches change, rosters change, but there have been some. They they have been, and I know they won the Stanley Cup in 2011. I'm with you on that. Like I get it, but. They're, but they've been part of some just like really inexplainable efforts, in my opinion, in some really big games and under d- three different coaches. And I'm going to give three different game sevens that pop into my mind with each coach. 
that I just was asking where they were. And the first one would be 2000. And, uh, well, actually, there's four. So there's 2012, the year after they won the cup, and you, you lost to the Capitals in seven at home in the first round. And that was an upset, right? You're the cup champions. And, and you kind of lost on a, you know, Joel Ward scored, but I think Tyler Sagan had the only goal of the game for you. And it was, he was like diving in the crease. And like, so you lost that one. You lost 2014 to Montreal at home. That was a dud of a game. Bruins just no showed. Um, that's all that's under Claude Julian. Bruce Cassidy, of course, 2019. People, people rewrite that game to sit there and say, Jordan Bennington just stood in his head and he's the only reason that the Blues won that game. It's not true. Like the Bruins outplayed the Blues in the first period, but they weren't, it wasn't, the ice was not as tilted as people remember it. And then the, the, the last 40 minutes of that game, the Bruins got completely outplayed and, and no showed game seven. And then of course, with Jim Montgomery this year, you they literally no showed the first 40 minutes of game seven. I know Krejci had a power play goal, but like it was, it was the, the garden was booing. That so, was some of the worst hockey I've seen. It was. And, and so for me, the co- there, there's different examples of Game 7s in Boston where under Claude Julian, Bruce Cassidy, and Jim Montgomery, regardless of the coach, regardless of the surrounding rosters, some of the Bruins' key core players over the last decade plus just have failed to perform in those moments. And I know there's other ones where they have. I know. Game 7, all the Game 7s in 2011, Game 7 and 13 against Toronto. I, I'm, I Totally, I get it. Even that game against Toronto. They were down, like we all know they were down. That was even the first 50 minutes of that game, the Bruins sucked. So, but I'm just, I guess I'm just like, as, as somebody who's watched this team for like my whole life and I've cheered for them, I've like watched almost every game and I love these players. I think part of me, it's, I am mad at the players because time and time again, like they have failed and, and oftentimes not shown up in, in these big moments. And it's like, how many times can you sit there and just let that happen and sit there and just lick your wounds before you learn? And I know they won an 11, but and and now and now it could be all be for naught, and so it's part of their legacy. And I'm just really I'm beyond the coaches. Like there are constants with this team of of every time you've you've come up short in these games and really like not shown up. Like those like a couple of key players have always been there. Yeah, I don't know. And, and 2018, 2019 against Toronto, two other wins. But Brian, I think you're you're getting towards something that I've started thinking about more, only because I feel like I've heard this. I expected to hear this from talk radio shows and have, but just from like friends and fans, like people who are like legitimately really frustrated with the players and, or who are like cheering for Cassidy in Vegas, not just because they like Cassidy, but also like almost in to spite the Bruins because they're just like so annoyed by this whole situation of they got, you know, a good popular coach fired basically. And then choked in the first round and it what's crossed my mind is like is this actually gonna like have an effect on some of these guys legacies like if this if Bergeron and Krejci do retire this offseason like the the final lasting image of the end of their careers is that choke job in round one and then the coach that they didn't like winning the Stanley Cup like in his first year away from Boston. I mean, that's tough. Like obviously those guys are ultimately like in the big picture are always going to be loved and they're going to get their days when their numbers are retired and like they they will be legends forever. I'm not saying it like ruins their legacy or anything like that, but I do think like this is kind of becoming part of it. Um, and especially the idea that they, left at least one, arguably two cups on the table. Um, You know, we don't know how this would have played out had they held on against Florida. You know, maybe they run into trouble in another round. Maybe they run into trouble now in the finals against Vegas. But uh, there does seem to be like, there's now been enough years of disappointment that, you know, 2011 gets further and further in the rearview mirror. And it's, you know, a lot of disappointment and a lot of letdowns since then that I think don't totally overshadow that, but certainly factor into the equation and are, are part of it just like 2011 is part of it. Yes. And so like another thing that you were saying, Brian and and, and you too, Scott, like people are maybe turning on the players a little bit. I want to transition this conversation into something we want to react to a clip 
that was from one of our shows on WEI, Jones and Mego, because yesterday they were talking about Bergeron and they were kind of turning on Bergeron and blaming him for, you know, not being healthy and dragging the team down. I mostly disagree with what they're saying. I'm going to play it and we can react to it. I'm not waiting around for Bergeron to let me know when he wants to be done now, especially after last year's You don't year's think stunt. that they owe him that? No. They've already they've done that for him like three times already. Like they well, just did it last. Before. How many times yeah, are you going to do it? Year. How many times are you going to do it? Every single year, forever. This is like the this is like the Belichick well, but, thing now. I know it's it's just a matter of how you think that a player like that should be treated at the end of a their player career. like what he's won one cup in his career and he wasn't the captain of the team. It's like look, he's a good player, but like. I gotta tr- I gotta treat him like he just he gets to stay no, for as long as he wants who the, forever. Who the franchise has tied their culture to heavily. The whole Selkie Trophy thing, blah right. blah 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 blah. Like I understand that that doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't, but it means something to them. Right, and so they I, should. I the culture is losing in the second Correct. round. It I mean, should, that's what that, the culture. This is what I'm saying. Well, it's it should, it should mean the first round now. So. <laughs> now it's the first it should, round. Yeah. It should mean less to them. Like what? What is that culture? What? Where does it get you at the end of the day? We mock heat culture all we want. We should be mocking Bruins culture because at, le- at least heat culture, you mix in a finals appearance every once and then. They might win the thing this year. Bruins culture, ugh. Like, let's not mock heat culture anymore if we're going to champion up Patrice Bergeron. How do you think Marshan feels if they decide to cut he's, Bergeron? He's probably off in he's the probably not thrilled. And you know what? Then 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 you cut Marshan. Yes. Too? Then you then that's maybe your avenue for making your bold Kachuk decision. You know, like your Kachuk level decision. Okay. Marshan, you're not happy that Bergeron's gone? Okay, now you're going to be all hot and bothered and upset? Good, you can go. You can go. And I like Brad Marshan, and I like his contract, but he's also valuable, and if you can cash that chip in high, that's probably not the worst idea in the world. You'd still have a good core if you're talking about keeping Bertuzzi and keeping Orloff. You have McAvoy. You have Pasternak. You know, Zaka finished much better than I thought last year. They got much more out of him. I feel confident in him as a top six guy. There's more there than I would have given it credit for. All right. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I guess maybe starting with the Bergeron stuff, um, you know, him saying that why why do the Bruins owe Bergeron to let him come back if he wants to come back? Throw that to you guys first. Uh, to me, cap situation plays a lot into it, and they didn't mention that at all. Uh, you're not they don't just have another number one center that they're just going to find out of thin air. Uh, so anyway. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I was going to say, like, for starters, Bergeron is, at worst, still a top 10 to 12 center in the NHL. And if you can find another one of those who will play for you for $2.5 million, then great, go get them. Uh, Good luck with that. So that's number one why, you know, if Bergeron wants to come back on cheap money again, you say, yes, please, thank you, because you're not finding any other center who's that good, who's going to play for that cheap when you're right up against the cap, for one. So the stuff about, you know, does he, like, deserve to go on his terms or whatever, I guess I would say, like, if he were really in decline and, like, noticeably hurting the team, I'd be like, okay, yeah, you might have to make some tough decisions, but... He's not. He still had a really good season. Playoffs aside, injury, late season injury aside and all that stuff. Like, he was still playing at a really high level most of the year. So He also played a majority of the games up until they started to kind of rest some of the older guys. Like, he had, for a long portion of the season, played every game. Yeah, he had played every game until they basically forced him to sit. So, yeah. and by the way, could have, had they not basically forced rest on him, it could have been the first season of in his career that he played all 82, which I'm sure would have meant something to him, but he also understood why they wanted to rest him and went along with the plan. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, like because of how they went out this year, everything's fair game. Like everything's open season in terms of ripping the players and the team's leadership. And that includes Bergeron. So like, I'm not surprised that, you know, that some people are, including Jones, aren't willing to give him a free pass and aren't letting him off the hook. Like, to an extent, I think that's warranted and fair. Um, But if you're telling me, like, if you're asking me, are you better next year with Bergeron back for $2 million again or 
plan X to try to fill that spot, you, you're better with Bergeron because you're either you're not finding another center as good that you can afford, or you're trading off so many other pieces to get another good center that you can afford that it kind of all washes out in the end and you haven't actually gotten any better. So that that's my, like if Bergeron wants to come back, you're, you're taking him back because he's better than your alternatives because you're too cap strapped to really do anything else. That's meaningful in terms of replacing him. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Scott, if if Bergeron wants to come back, and I and, and look, I know I was just talking a few minutes ago about how I'm starting to get a little disappointed with some, you know, lackluster performances at home in front of Boston fans over the years. But that's that can be true while I'm still saying, like, yeah, if he wants to come back, you bring him back. What I would say to Jones is like, well, what like what what do you want them to do next year? Because if Jones wants them to, to like to to tank, that's like that's fine. Um, but they don't have, they don't have as we currently speak a first or second round pick this year or next. So tanking. And I don't involve. think that was his point. I think he's saying that Bergeron hurts the team, like in a team like a contending team. Well then, okay. Well then, in that situation, I would just defer to what Scott was just saying. Like, how, like how does that make you better? And and you don't have the money. A and there's the there's just it just it just I think, make sense. So listening listening to more of the show and not just that one clip, like I think Jones's idea is he wants to turn over the core and like change the culture, which is kind of what he references with like the the idea of like the Matthew Kachuk trade, which you know I've we talked about that last podcast too about that could have potentially been on the table last summer. Um, but I think Jones wants something like that. Like he wants to kind of turn the page on this core, turn to the next core and like make some sort of move that shakes, shakes up the room, changes the culture. Like, I think, I think that's what he wants more than like a full tear down. Okay. And so, and so that's, and so that's fair. It's just that for Bergeron in particular, as it pertains to Bergeron, it's he's either retiring or he's coming back. Like there, like there's no, you're not trading him to another team. So, so in that, so in Jones's situation, what he wants is for the Bruins, hypothetically, would be either Bergeron retires or Bergeron says, "I want to come back," and the Bruins say, "No." Okay, fine. Let's play that out for a second. In one of those situations, if Bergeron didn't come back, in that situation, if Bergeron doesn't come back, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm f- honestly like I don't think the Bruins are even close to winning a Stanley Cup. First of all, even if Bergeron comes back next year, it's going to be tough for them to build the roster they want to build to compete for a cup just because of the cap constraints that they have. But if he doesn't come back, this Bruins team, they're not they are not winning a cup next year. You don't have a number one center. And I promise you that they don't have the, the resources to go out and get a proper one and still have a great team around them. So in that situation, I personally would not – like you need to – you if you're not winning and Bergeron's gone – I would sell high on Brad Marchand if Bergeron goes because why? Because you need to you need to start recollecting draft collateral and and and, and prospects and anything that you can for the future of this team. But the Boston Bruins ownership they won't do it. I, they won't do that. It, I would be stunned, absolutely stunned, if they made if they took steps if they willingly took steps backward backwards to go steps forward in the future because the it's just not the way the Jacobs family operates. They want to be competitive. They want their playoff gates. But like if you're asking me if I were building a team or trying to trying to re rebuild a team going forward, like I know you have a couple of key pieces in place, but I don't know. It, it's a very tricky situation, but I would be very open to trying to sell high on Brad Marshall and a couple of other older p- veteran players if you if you find if you find out that your number one center is no longer coming back and your team's strapped for cash anyway i just don't think the 2023 24 bruins are destined for a long stanley cup run and i know the brew and another reason that reason that the bruins ownership won't want to accept a rebuild year next year is because it's the team centennial and they're going to want to have to they don't want to have to market this team as somebody who's trying to rebuild they're going to try to want to put a a team out there next year for a lot of different reasons so um 
I understand Jones's frustration with the with wanting to shake things up. I, I I'm open to change because you know what, whether we like it or not, even if like like change is happening soon because Bergeron and Martian only have so many years left. So like we better get used to the idea of that change happening. Um, but I think he's being a little bit disingenuous when it comes to Bergeron and what he means to the Bruins and as and how he is as a player. But yeah, and, I, uh, I don't know. and Megan going in the Selkies and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, like, yes, he got those awards. It's whatever. He probably doesn't give a shit that he got an award, but it's, it represents how good of a player he is and how good of a 200 foot player he is. And by the way, he's going to win another one this year. <laughs> those aren't in the past. Like he's still playing like that. Like certain times during that, I wanted to hit my face against the wall. Um, what would you, what would you two, what would you, Bridget, we'll start with you. Cause, but, cause I just, really interrupted you but what what would you do and, <laughs> yes. and, and then and then scott like, like would you would you be open to um to trading martian if if bergeron didn't come back would you sell high on a player like that me first um so i was actually just about to make this point that bergeron without bergeron who's your next leader obviously you know maybe they've been grooming charlie mcavoy a little bit but when bergeron was out of the playoffs it was marshawn marshawn was the guy and, and I was watching one of the last behind the bees recently as well. And he's the guy in the room that everybody was respecting and listening to. And if you want to keep the same culture, which I do think that they like the culture that they have, I don't necessarily think that they need to blow up the, the cultural aspect of it because um, it's a hardworking culture. It's, you know, very accountable culture of players. Marshawn has taken over and matured into one of those roles. So I, I also don't see this them trading Marshawn as like a first option either. I think they have other options to move and that will make the team good enough that this is another playoff team at the very least, obviously not in as good a position as they were in this year. But if we're talking about being able to move Omar or Hall and being able to sign Bertuzzi, then if you keep Marshawn around, he could be one of your leaders. He could be your captain. Um, and you're not in as tough a position as it looked like you're going to be. And you're getting draft capital back from an all-mark trade. Um, not as much as if you had trade both trade both of those guys, but I think that's a better option for the Bruins than trading Marshawn. Yeah, I think there's I think there's value in having Marshawn as the next captain to kind of bridge things to the next era. And so I wouldn't I wouldn't want to trade him this offseason. I could be open to it if they're really struggling, like they're not even hanging around playoff contention, looking at it, you know, either this trade deadline or next offseason, because he does it, he has a very tradable contract. I mean, 6.12 million. Like this isn't a this isn't like a Jonathan Taves or Patrick Kane situation where it's like, well, yeah, they could have traded him two years ago, but no one wanted to take on, you know, three years, 10 and a half million a year. Like Martian has a very tradable contract and there would be a lot of buyers. So I do think you could definitely get something for him, but for the Bruins, like I, I think kind of to Bridget's point, like there's, there's a real value in having him as the next captain, as the next leader to sort of bring along this next group, because I'm also not sure that, you know, whether it's, McAvoy or Pasternak, I think those guys are growing into more leadership roles year by year, but I don't know if they're really ready to be captains yet. Um, so I would not trade Marshand. I would definitely look at be looking at other pieces, which you know is why we've touched on multiple times. You know your Taylor Hall or or Lena Solmark. Um, but you know if things went south and the Bruins weren't closed and maybe Martian wants, you know, go somewhere, have a chance to win a cup or something. I don't know. Like I could be open to it down the road, but in the short term, like I think, I think you would want him around for the transition away from the Bergeron era. I, I will say, I think it's not that I disagree with you about Pasternak or, Mac, or McAvoy not being totally ready for a captaincy, but Pashnak made his NHL debut in November of 2014. It's June of 2023. Mm, 
And he's also a 61 goal scorer and is one of the more prominent goal scorers in the world at his profession. But we also know there's that no like reason. not, not hmm? everybody has the exact like personality of speaking up and like that's not really been his role in what we've seen. I I feel like he's more vocal in the room than, than we may know because I I in in certain clips in the locker room I always see him kind of stepping up and talking. But it and but to your point though, I mean maybe he's not naturally that guy. Do they want him to be that guy? And and if they do, I feel like he's twenty seven years old or twenty six. I mean he's been at least since he was eighteen. I mean he's he should be ready for that at this point, right? So I mean I don't know. Maybe, but maybe he's not the guy. Maybe, maybe they want McAvoy to be that guy. I don't know. I'm just saying, based on league tenure and 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 prominence and status in the league, and he's an outgoing person. I, I do think he should be ready to take that at this point. He's not 21. He's, you know what I mean? Yeah, I I think it's it's fair. You're right. Like he's not a kid, but I I also think it's probably not something that really has come naturally to him. Like I said, I think it's been a slow growth same with McAvoy I don't think he was really like a natural vocal leader from from day one I think you know I think there's other guys who maybe were more like I think Brandon Carlo had more natural leadership ability kind of at a, at a young age but then it's you know is your captain going to be a second pairing kind of stay at home defender like you do want it to be someone prominent higher up in the lineup so Yes, I think it, it is probably McAvoy or Pasenak. Um, But I still think, I don't know. I think, do, do I think like they'd flop on their face if it got turned over to them right now? No, I don't. I think they'd, they've learned enough. But I don't know. I just think there would still be value with Marsh. And like, I would like to see them, you know, I think one year of Marsh with the C, McAvoy and Pasenak with the two A's like makes a lot of sense to me, but you know, if, if you're someone like Jones, like who, who just wants kind of pull the whole bandaid off at once and, and get going on the next era, then yeah, then absolutely. Like you can explore trading Martian. Cause like I said, like he would still have real value. It's he's still a really good player and it's a very tradable contract. So um I guess I'm not totally opposed to it. Like if you get blown away, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be my first choice. That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> there's, there's just like sometimes I just want to scream. But uh, now to the last little portion of it was about Bertuzzi and Orloff um, and a, attempting to keep Bertuzzi and Orloff. Now, Orloff is not a guy that we really have talked much about the Bruins keeping because it kind of seems like he would be one of those free agents that um, just kind of doesn't, there's no cap space for. Um, so that was, I was kind of surprised when he, I wasn't surprised about him mentioning Bertuzzi, um, but I was surprised about him mentioning Orlov as another player that, that he wanted cap space for. Yeah. I mean, I would like to keep Orlov. I think a couple mistakes in the playoffs aside, like, played very well and is exactly what you want on that left side to go along with Lindholm because there's, it feels like they have to keep searching for that over and over and over again, because they don't totally trust Grizzly in the top four in the playoffs, four boards over his head playing that high in the lineup. So I would love to keep Orlov, but like, I'm just looking at evolving hockey. They project five years, $6.3 million a year. I just don't know where that money's coming from. Like you have to work. You have to do so much just to free up the money for Bertuzzi, who feels like more of a priority because he's younger that I don't know how you then free up even more to keep Orlov too. Like it's now, like now you're basically talking about, you have to find trade partners because remember you still have to fill out the rest of your, like you still have an entire bottom six to fill out. And even if that were all AHL guys, that's going to cost about $5 million to do. And if you have any hopes at all, you don't really want it to be all rookies. Like you want some experience there, but to me, like the only way you can pull this off is if like, it's forget one of Haller, all Mark. Now you have to trade both. You have to trade at least one or two of those left shot defensemen. 
guys like Forbert Riley. And like you're maybe even looking at at now, can you trade Charlie Coyle? I don't personally I don't really think there's gonna be much of a market for him at his current contract. Mm-hmm. Um and the Bruins need centers anyways. So I don't really think that's on the table, but like you're talking about trading away like four guys minimum, maybe five, just to have enough money to keep Bertuzzi, Orlov, and then fill out the rest of the roster. And I just don't think that's realistic. Like, I don't think there's enough of a market for some of these guys. So it seems very unlikely to me, but, you know, if there were some miracle way to do it, sure. I I like Dmitry Orlov, and I think he probably has at least a few good years left. You know, he's not, I think he's 32, right? He's not like 35. So, um, yeah, I would like to do that. I just don't really see how, how the Bruins get there. I mean, I honestly can't think of a – I mean, besides Pasternak and his 61 goals, and, and and obviously we had an interesting hypothetical conversation last episode about, you know, would we ever trade him for for somebody that could chuck back in the day. But in all in all seriousness, like aside from Pasternak, like I, and maybe Pavel Zaka just because of the importance of the position uh, that he's being asked to play going forward, and he did have a great year. But, like, I can't think of a forward on this Bruins roster I'd rather have over Bertuzzi. Not Taylor Hall, I mean, honestly, not even Brad Marchand, given his age. Like I, I would, like Tyler Bertuzzi, I, I would, I would take him for the next eight years or seven years, and I wouldn't Marchand for the next three. Like I just, like he, I want him at, at to whatever the Bruins have to do to keep Bertuzzi. I want him on this team going forward more so than anybody. Like I don't care, at least up front. So if if you can find ways to like. There's, there are no untouchables for me anymore after the, after this past year's performance. None. I mean, you can sit there and say McAvoy and, and Passion Act, sure, but like, I, I really am just like, I don't care. Move who you have to move if you can keep this kid and have the cap space for him. So, yeah, as, as far as Orloff goes, like, yeah, it's, it's to your point, it's going to be tough to do both. If one or the other, it, for me, it's Bertuzzi. Um, but I hope they find a way. Um, I also had one other question for you guys before we go. Uh, it it kind of popped into my mind when, when you guys were talking about um, a little bit of the just I, somebody the, the leadership and McAvoy and stuff. And does watching does watching the postseason run that Brandon Montour has had up into the Cup Finals and watching the performance and the confidence that a shade Theodore plays with for Vegas and Obviously, Alex Petrangelo is a rock for for Vegas, as he was for St. Louis a couple of years ago. D- does watching any of these performances make you just like, just maybe just think about McAvoy, his playoffs this year and last year, and just and I know we've touched on it briefly in the past, but just like shouldn't shouldn't he be like having some some of these just ultra confident walk the line plays? Like he 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 should be there at this point, and he does it here and there. But man, I, watching McAvoy, like he really is in my opinion, at both ends of the ice and physicality wise and hockey IQ, he really is one of the more talented defensemen I've ever seen play. And, and, and sp- especially on the Bruins. And I just, I watched like Shea Theodore, like just make this great move on, on Anthony Declare, and, um, and you watch and score a goal and he's got a couple goals in the finals and you watch what Brandon Montour did against McAvoy and the Bruins. And it's just like, I know McAvoy should be doing these things. And have you guys, has this thought crossed your minds at all watching some of these guys play? Yeah, it, it crossed my mind kind of during and right after the Bruins series, but you're right. You know, watching other defensemen do it throughout the spring. Yeah. Like I think Charlie McAvoy for the most part, I think has been solid in the playoffs, but we haven't really seen him like, take over and look like the star that I think we all expect and that we've seen from him in the regular season. Like, you know, we talked about it this year. Like he had that stretch. It, I remember it felt like it came like right after Bridget posed the question of, you know, who's having the better season McAvoy or Lindholm. And it was like, McAvoy just went on like an absolute heater for like the next month. And it's like, wow. Like, yeah, this is a guy who can win the Norris, like who can do it all. And then you, we haven't really seen that in the postseason, and I think that's absolutely fair. Um, you definitely expect to see that from him at some point, and you you would have hoped 
you know, it would have happened by now. And I know last year that shoulder injury he was dealing with, like that happened later in the Carolina series. So maybe it affected how that ended. Um, you know, and he had like that COVID bout and whatever. So like that was a weird series for him for a couple of reasons. But this year, yeah, I thought, I thought he was fine against Florida, but you expect a lot more than fine from him. And it felt like that was a series that he should have been able to do more because Florida is not the tightest team defensively. Like there was ice to be had and it didn't really feel like you saw him take full advantage of that. You saw it. There were like a couple shifts later in the series where I thought you saw him really involved offensively and starting to make an impact. And it's like, when you did see, you're like, huh, wait, why haven't I seen more of that through like the first five games? So yeah, did you want more there? Um, I can't say I'm like worried about Charlie McAvoy or, or anything, or, you know, I'm not really thinking he's like, Oh, he doesn't perform in the playoffs. Like, you know, maybe a few years from now, if we still haven't seen it, I'll, I'll think that, but yeah, you would expect a little more by now and hope for more, you know, next time Bruins are in the playoffs. Yeah, and I don't know what it is about, like, thinking back to the series, I didn't think McAvoy was one of the reasons why they, you know, they failed, but I also can't really point to too many really impactful plays um, from him either. And watching Brendan Montour in particular, um, he seems to have reached another level. And obviously he was a guy that he was drafted, Montour was drafted in the second round. I think he was like number 52 overall, something like that. I don't know. He was at UMass when I was there, so I used to have to talk about him a lot. Um, I He has really grown into a top NHL defenseman where he wasn't necessarily expected to be. And um, he's really taken his role and run with it. And, and um, you know, I think we've seen – that McAvoy can be one of those impact players with a huge hit um, at the right time. Or, um, you know, he has good vision on the power play. He has offensive ability, um, not maybe as much offensive upside as someone like Montour, but um, in general, he's a, a big guy. Um, maybe it is, you know, just about maturing a little bit more, understanding the moment a little bit more. I, I don't think, I think all the guys can wrap their heads around that kind of stuff, but um, yeah, I think, I think you're right about that. It's, it's a fair, it's a fair thing to point out though. At the same time, it's not like we're sitting around and saying, Oh, you know, what's going on with Charlie McAvoy. It's just that some other guys really did take their opportunities and, and ended up shining in the playoffs. Yeah. I just remember watching game three, Puck drops two seconds later. I think it was Anton Lundell's on his ass, and, and and McAvoy put him there and set the whole tempo for the game. And he was unreal that game. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, do you expect that every single shift of every single game? No, but it's like, dude, that's like that's that's who you that's who you can be at the highest level when you want to be. And I don't know. It's and, and yeah, he he was fine. He was fine. But to your point, Scott, like like fine's not good enough for for for, for him and. And, I mean, like, I, yeah. I think of, like, the bubble series against Carolina, too, where I think it was Jordan Stahl that he drilled, mm-hmm. and it felt like that was, like, a real momentum-changing hit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he has so many ways that he can change momentum. Um, and, you know, it's not like he never does it, but it, it feels like there's more opportunities to do it than than what we see sometimes. Right. And, Bridget, you made you made a point. You, you said something along the lines of he – he wasn't one of the reasons that they lost. And that's like totally true, but it's like, and I think this is kind of what you were referring to at the end, but it's like, he, but he also wasn't one of the reasons that they won. Right. Like, like, yeah. like, you know, you can't just be, you, you, like he's supposed to be a difference maker in a positive way. And he does it at times and he's been fine, but fine. Yeah. It's just something that came to my mind. I'm watching Shay Theodore. Like Shay Theodore is not Charlie McAvoy, but like he, he's mm-hmm. doing better than him in the spring. So whatever. They needed one of McAvoy or Lindholm to step up in the playoffs and play their best hockey. And neither of them did. And we find out about Lindholm's injury with his foot, but um, you know, that's a little bit of an excuse and, and explains a little bit on his side, but one of those two guys they needed, those are their 
two most elite defensemen um, that can do a little bit of everything. They needed one of those two elite guys to do more step up. And it seemed like neither of them rose all the way to the occasion. No, you're right. And when you have two guys that should be Norris candidates, it's, you know, you, you got to have one of those. I mean, we're, the, the devils aren't doing what they did back in the day. If Scott, one of Scott Stevens and Scott Needham, aren't, aren't, you know, performing the way that they were in the regular season. You can't just have, you can't just have Norris caliber defenseman just kind of go back into a, you know, being a shell of themselves. And who, was it you, Scott, that tweeted this? I saw this, that the Anaheim Ducks decor from, I don't know, was it five or so years ago had like such an, it was such an incredible decor. It had Montour and Lindholm on it and it had, it, they Anaheim obviously blew up their team over the past few years, but at one point in time, their their decor was just in, insanely good. If you look at where the guys have gone to now and what the careers have turned into, um, and they were young at the time. Like Lindholm was really young, Montour was new. Um, I got to try to find it, but it Theodore. was it, it was a like it was ridiculous the the decor that they would have had if they didn't just blow it up. Yeah, that, that wasn't me, but yeah, there was a ton of talent. I mean, Cam Fowler, another high pick. Like, yeah, they they had a lot. So so list list them off. So yeah, so their decor was Cam Fowler, Shea Theodore, Brandon Montour, Hampus Lindholm, Josh Manson, and who are the six one was, right? It was probably I mean, Francois Beauchemin was still around. I always thought he was really underrated. Like Yeah, he was. He wasn't as young as those guys, but he uh he was a really solid defenseman for a bunch of years there. Yeah. Yeah. And that Ducks team, like they, they did go to a couple of conference finals, at least one, maybe, but two. I think they went to two. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that honestly, they, cause they, cause they lost the Blackhawks one time and it's like, and just, just one final thought on like, like what Jones was saying earlier about just how the Bruins, and I know we're up against it, but like how he was just talking about how, like, eh, what's their, what's their culture? They're out in the second round all the time. And it's like, you know, you think about it and the Bruins, regular season wise over the last like call it 12 years maybe it's call it since like 2010 2009 like the Bruins I think regular season wise have probably the second best record in the NHL dating back a dozen years and they have been to three Stanley Cup finals and they've won one so there there's definitely you know they I mean they've they've won probably what 15 16 playoff series in that time but like the Kings have two cups in that time. The Lightning have three cups um, in the last 20 years. The Penguins have three cups. The Blackhawks have three cups. So, like, there there are enough miniature dynasties that have happened while the Bruins have had that regular season success. And I think that's also why it kind of feels like they've just, you know, left a couple up there and have fallen short, you know? I, I said this in the final Sunday skate, but, like, to me, when you assume – you know, if there isn't another cup for this Bruins core and it's it's hard to see how they get there at this point. The Kings are like the one that like throws it all off because it's like you're going to look back in this era and you're absolutely right. Like You should be talking if Pittsburgh and Chicago have three and you're just one behind like I think that like that's fine. You're OK. You weren't quite them, but you were clearly one of the best of your era. The fact that they only have one with how good they've been pretty much year in, year out. And the Kings have two with like a much smaller window in terms of when they were actually truly competitive at like a Stanley Cup level. Like that hurts because it's like you were for this era as a whole, you were way better than the Kings. And yet they have two cups, you have one. Like well, that's that's the one that's hard hard to get past. The not getting that second one was crippling for them for the for this legacy because you look at Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay has been to four Stanley Cup finals since 2015. Four. They're two and two. They've lost two. They've won two. But nobody looks at Tampa as losers. You know what I mean? That that's not getting that second one. You know, being being one and three versus two and three, that's a big difference. You can forget everybody has to lose. There's always one loser a year in the cup finals. Like, you know, to lose once out of three, three attempts that that happens. But to be one, one and two in the three attempts and then a couple of years where they should have probably gone deeper like this year. And they just so it's 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 
it's I don't know. It's like they deserve, you know, if you de- if you deserve the accolades for winning in 2011, you deserve criticism for falling short every other year. And this is the way that it yeah. is. So. Sure, sure. I, I mean, the other one is the the three times they won the president's trophy, they won a grand total of one playoff series in those three seasons. Mm-hmm. The, the the bubble year against Carolina. That's it. Mm-hmm. Well, they beat Detroit two and fourteen. Oh, you're right. Okay, so so two. Yeah. I yeah no it, the criticism is is there for sure. Um, some sometimes just the the way that he puts it like that it's a culture pro- like Bergeron like somehow saying it's a culture problem and Bergeron is some sort of a culture like cancer is like the absolute opposite of what most people would say about Bergeron for his entire career I'd love to see Andrew Raycroft and him have that conversation I'm sure like those two go at each other when they're on the radio together um one one of these days Raycroft will call him a bozo probably but uh <laughs> that's it's just Obviously, we have a different perspective than talk radio hosts because we're trying to talk about things a little bit differently than stir the pot, you know, and I fall for it every time. So <laughs> good job, Jones. Listen to Jones and Mego. Uh, listen to all our programming, but um, especially in this time of year where we are, um you know, kind of just sitting around waiting on some of the news to drop, whether it be retirements, whether it be free agent signings, um, you know, contracts for Swayman or or Frederick or whomever. And there's a lot that's going to happen this offseason. We are still, however, waiting on those things. So uh, this is what we, we end up talking about. And by the way, just remember to send us your um questions we'll do another mailbag segment soon so comment on our youtube with whatever questions or even if you just want to throw a, an idea out there that we can react to um we've been doing that as well so uh and then scott what's the email <laughs> skatepod at wei.com send your questions uh, to skatepod uh and we also are on twitter so any comments made on our post there uh we'll look at as well yeah, I mean, look, if you if you found the three of us to be a little melancholy today, it's just it's just because it's it, you know it's it's a fresh reminder during the Cup Finals of like what could have been, and it's just it's it's reopening some some wounds that have been healing the last what's already been two months, you know. But we have to also discuss. the weather. The last like six days has been the worst weather, and we're like trapped inside because the air quality alert that's going on, and it's like I've just been inside like cooped up. And it was hailing earlier. Like, I don't know. We've had some really miserable weather. Uh, Time to stew on certain things. And uh, that's just that's just what we're doing. Oh, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Do we have time? Can we do this? Um, The video of the the video of the female uh, reporter. Oh, yeah. To look up her name. Um, Stiff arming the guy. Um, during the at, at the Vegas Golden Knights game. So if you didn't see it, I am gonna have to pull it up myself uh, to just to make sure I get her name right. Um, but so she's she's out she's just doing a live shot at the Florida Knights game game two. And she's kind of set up in the crowd and this fan. Samantha to, Rivera. Samantha Rivera. Rivera. It's been a viral clip if you haven't seen it. It's it's on like Bleacher Report, Open Ice, is Instagram, and just a bunch of different places. Um, and so she has to, like, knock this guy out of her shot. And she's just like, no, 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 no. Like, and, and she's like, throw us to the highlights. And then I was just looking at that, like, that happens. Like, in my time broadcasting, and I'm not even doing NHL games. It's, you know, college hockey games. But college hockey fans are drunk college dudes usually um this happens like they jump out and they try to like distract you or they say something weird or they like you have to just kind of keep your composure and it's so frustrating it was so funny to see her stiff arm that guy because like sometimes I don't know what I'm gonna do when they're trying to distract me and like I don't know jump in front of or behind my shot and I just I could relate to that (laughs) yeah that was a plus net front position boxing out just mm-hmm. not letting yeah. anyone get into the paint because i've had people at like umass lowell try to and like 
messed me up doing a like a pregame like recording of like our open and UConn I had people behind me like making faces and stuff and I was like uh it happens and especially Vegas that atmosphere at Vegas was so loud and so rowdy but just a reminder please if you see us on camera don't just don't do it just don't like pop up and be like trying to be on tv and it's just very frustrating it's annoying came until next year it makes us want to stiff arm you it makes us want to do more than that probably but (laughs) next year next time you're at a broadcasting you lol bridget at the song guess you just like see scott jump in front of the camera with popcorn <laughs> yeah go go around and then i'm just gonna palm his face <laughs> right out of the shot <laughs> yeah no oh, yeah, right. today, don't don't be don't be an ass hat right don't Respect. please don't um yeah anyway i just uh, thought that was funny that was one of the more viral things that happened with uh the that i saw on hockey social media this week all right, uh, Bridget, Scott, any anything else? No. Nope. Nope. All right. Well, then we will talk to you all soon for a mailbag episode. Thank you all for listening. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.